Today's episode of the Believe in Steelers show brought to you by betonline.ag, AFC Championship game, NFC Championship game this weekend. If you want to place a bet on any of the NFL playoff action, head to betonline.ag, use our promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-V. You can see that on your screen right now. You'll receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet online where the game starts. Welcome to the Believe in Steelers show on the Believe Network. I'm your host, Mark Bergen. Joined today by Believe in Bears host and good friend of the show, Joey Christopoulos. Joey, friend of the show, it's good to see you again, my man. How are you doing this afternoon? Uh, happy New Year, Yinzer Nation. Uh, Mark, so happy to be on the show with you. For those that only check out Believe in Steelers, good for you, first of all. Second of all, me and Mark have had a fantastic time hosting these Believe NFL Lives throughout the season. Um, it's been fantastic. I'm excited to talk to you about Steelers, maybe some Bears, NFL at large. Mm -hmm. We got an NFC AFC championship game this weekend, man. I am so excited to be here. Let's do it. We've got a lot to discuss here on today's show, Joey, and we're blessed with some breaking news on today's show, the Panthers, first domino to, fa to fall in the NFL coaching carousel. They're going to hire Frank Wright. I want to get to your first reaction, and I'll go from there. Joey, the floor is yours. What do you make of this news today? Like a lot of NFL teams, it's the inverse, right? Let's go get the hot college name. Wait, the hot college name didn't work, so let's go maybe get a guy with a little bit of some experience. Uh, my first blush reaction is I I'm this is a very curious move for two reasons. One, uh, as Steelers Nation probably knows, I have a lot of uh, you know my wife is a Steelers fan, so I talked to a lot of Steelers fans in her family. They were hoping that Matt Canada was going to be shown the door, and then they might put in a phone call with a guy like Frank Reich. That was the pie in the sky, and I think a lot of other organizations were maybe thinking about him for an OC position. Now he finds himself as the head coach of the Carolina Panthers. What's fascinating for me, Mark and I'm curious to hear how you feel about this, is they're hiring Frank Reich with no particular direction at quarterback at this time. So mm -hmm. sometimes it goes one of two ways. The first way is that the coach goes, hey, I want to bring in my guy. I want to coach my guy. Sometimes it's a tandem. This appears to be more of a situation of Frank Reich just saying, I'll coach whoever you put out in front of me, which I think now all of a sudden keeps the options for the Carolina Panthers mm -hmm. pretty wide open, right? Do they... Do they invest in the draft? Are they looking at an Anthony Richardson? Do they hope a CJ Stroud falls to them? Are they hoping that they could possibly trade up and move up in the draft? Or now does it put them more in the market for the Derek Carrs of the world, the Jimmy G's of the world? And it is really interesting, Mark, that they, you know, for the Chicago Bears perspective, which we'll get to later, mm -hmm. beyond the guys being drafted in the NFL draft coming up, I can name eight or 10 quarterbacks that might be on the market this year that the Carolina Panthers and other teams will be able to choose from. And it looks like Frank Reich is saying, just give me whoever. I will coach whoever. Um, I, I do think it's a positive move for the Panthers. But again, let's see what they do at quarterback. I'm with you here. I hear all about David Tepper, though. And speaking of Pittsburgh connections, mm. used to be a minority owner at the Steelers, Joey. And so I hear about all about David Tepper and his approach and firing Matt Rule and Wilkes as the interim and is it going to work out and all of this. And my question is, is what does this mean for Scott Fitterer, the GM? How does he fit into all of this equation? Because you want to bring in a new quarterback, you have a new head coach. Okay, does that mean you keep Sam Darnold as like a bridge quarterback or PJ Walker until whichever rookie that you want to draft is ready? To me, it's even beyond just the quarterback position, but I wouldn't expect the Panthers to get so in middle of the road, because they just did that with Baker Mayfield. They just did that with Sam Darnold. And ultimately, it's like, who can be the guy in the post Cam Newton era? I Look, I'm with you. And the other thing to think about is where is what's the situation that Frank Reich is coming from? He's coming from a situation where they did retread at quarterback. And I think the, the interesting thing is that he got a job, a second job so quickly, which I think says across the NFL is that they think that he's a quality, talented head coach. It had maybe a little bit more to do with the decisions at quarterback with the Indianapolis Colts, and maybe he mm -hmm. just ran out of time more than anything else. So, again, Frank Reich is entering into somewhat of a similar situation, right, Mark? I mean, a team yeah. that's got some interesting pieces on both sides of the ball. You know, Brian Burns, DeForest Buckner. I know different players, but same position, same kind of talent, same type of running game. Um, I think, you know, the wide receiver position probably has a couple of questions to it. I'll put that in the Colts category, too, as well. 
But what do they do at quarterback? And, you know, I, I, my question for you is then, do you think that they're probably leaning towards a bigger swing than maybe, say, the Derek Carr, the retread, the thing that Frank Reich has seen the last three or four years of his coaching career? You would hope so, Joey, but is that guy going to be there at number nine? Is this a team that could potentially trade up in the draft? The Panthers with the ninth pick, is that blue chip quarterback that you seek there with the ninth overall pick? And we'll see with these drafts because the, the four guys I've seen, the kid from Kentucky, Stroud, Young, and then Anthony Richardson out of Florida are the four top I've seen, at least on the board so far. I want to get into the offseason, though, before I get into my quarterback evaluation <laughs> rankings. But like I said, the first domino falling, Joey. So this leads to there's four remaining vacancies left right now, Joey, in the Broncos, Cardinals, Colts, and Texans. If you're that dream coach and you have your pick of the four, which is the most appealing head coaching vacancy in your opinion? It just depends on what I value, Mark. Do I value time or do I value money? That is the question here. If I value, <laughs> if I value time, Mark, um, I'm probably looking at something along the lines of probably the Houston Texans or perhaps even maybe the Indianapolis Colts because they ha they have that high draft pick. You put yourself in a position to possibly draft a quarterback, and then that starts a whole clock where at, at least buys you three years. Right in this NFL where we turn coaches over like crazy with a new quarterback probably buys you three. If I want to get paid, though, I'm looking at the Denver Broncos because this isn't so much about, you know, is this a buyer's or a seller's market for the Denver Broncos? This is more of, hey, if you want me to come and fix this mess that you have created with the Denver Broncos, if you want me to fix Russell Wilson, I got the keys here. I've got the formula. I'll put it up on the whiteboard for you. It's going to cost you some money. Um, and, and, and that's probably the position that I'm looking at. You know, if you are a Denver Broncos head coach, it does put you in that situation, though, where you could get paid, but you could get fired in a couple of years because they're stuck with Russell Wilson. And if it doesn't work right away after that first year, and uh, they're not going to do another one and done, right? It just won't happen. But again, that probably puts you on a two year clock. So it, it's really kind of interesting between the Texans, the Cardinals, and the Colts, where you have that time. Right, you're waiting on Kyler Murray. You got a high draft pick, but with the Broncos, you can get that money because you can convince someone that you can fix what appears to be already broken in Denver. Let me take away the colors of the jerseys, the franchise, and the history, the past history of the franchise, and everything. Because yes. I look at the Texans on the outset, and it's like, whoa, man, four coaches in a three-year span. The end of the, the end of the Bill O'Brien area, Romeo Cornell, uh, David Culley, and then Lovey Smith this past season. Take that away, and we'll talk about Lovey in a second. Hang on. But you've got the second and the 12th pick if you're the Texans. To me, it's like you want to talk about being able to rebuild relatively quickly, strike gold on both of those picks, and it's not going to be doom and gloom for the Texans much longer, conceivably, conceivably. Now, if we're talking about tradition in terms of franchise success, to me, it is the Broncos. And I know that you're locked in with that Russell Wilson contract. You'd hope to be able to rekindle some sort of magic that he had to get that monstrosity of a contract. But at least with the Broncos, you have a pretty stout defense. You do have some young offensive talent. It's getting Russ back to doing the things that he did that made him so successful for several years in Seattle. And I'll just throw a name out there real quick. I know that he just got fired recently. I haven't really seen anyone reporting on it, but Byron Leftwich in Denver is interesting to me. Um, mm. and, and I'm curious to kind of hear what your take is. If you are the the Broncos brass right now, are you leaning defensive minded or are you leaning offensive minded? If it has to be offense, has bed, to be offense, has to because right? look, I know you want to zig when everyone else is zags. You look at mm -hmm. the teams in the division. Mahomes and Herbert aren't going anywhere for the next decade. So you've got to be able to keep pace with them. It's amazing because left, which was such a hot name a year ago. And then this year season, it's like it's fallen off a cliff. It's like, well, wait a second. Did he really have the personnel to be able to run the ball? Because the only other team that was worse than the Bucks this past season was the Rams at running the ball. So then the onus falls on an ancient Tom Brady to move your offense. And they had injuries throughout the offense and up front, including the center, Ryan Jensen. So it's like, does Brian Byron Leftwich just forget how to call plays and be successful with Tom, a Tom Brady led offense? To me, the answer is no. 
you can't make a gourmet meal with bologna and potato chips, Joey. And I, I would argue that's what he had this past season with the Buccaneers. And just let, let's just pile on really quick. I, I think it's fairly kind of disgusting what they've done to Byron Leftwich in Tampa. If we all remember correctly, he was a finalist for a Jacksonville Jaguars job. And I'm pretty sure Tampa Bay called him up and said, no, you know, stay in house. I'm sure Bruce Arians gave him a phone call and said, no, stay in house. Let's keep this going because you might have a future as a possible head coach in the Tampa Bay organization, or at the very least, we will help you get your next head coaching opportunity if you stick around. Next thing you know, they turn around and they fire the guy after he goes eight and nine with all the points that you've just made, especially when you begin a season where you have to lean on Leonard Fournette more than you used to because your rookie quarterback fumbles. I mean, that's a tale as old as time. You should have seen that coming. So this isn't a Byron Leftwich problem. This was a Tampa Bay Buccaneers organizational problem. And the way they kicked him out of the door, I I, I think it was wrong. It's terrible. You mentioned Frank Reich off the top of the show as a possibility if the Steelers would have had an opening at their offensive coordinator position. Byron left, which is another guy. Byron left, which is another guy who I would have considered for the Steelers to where I, I think that would be just a natural fit considering he played for the Steelers History. back in the day too. So if can listen, I understand why they kept Matt Canada. I was on record saying I wanted Canada gone after the bye week There's no doubt the Steelers offense improved on the back half of the season. But if that's not your base going into the 2023 season, there's going to be issues. And especially when there were candidates out there, Frank Wrights of the world, the Byron Leftwiches of the world, that, in my opinion, could upgrade your offense. I understand you're starting a new system, new scheme, new terminology, new playbook with Kenny Pickett. But Byron Leftwich is a guy that's out there right now that he might be better off out on the free market, Joey, than he would be being stuck in in the Tampa Bay organization because I don't think the Buccaneers know what Tom Brady's going to do. Greg Olson yeah. certainly doesn't. So it's like, you know, I know we're going <laughs> in a lot of different directions here, but well, uh, that's a but, hot name but, that's out there, Joey. And if I can follow up real quick for those that maybe missed uh, the last Believe in Steelers episode, um, is continuity the reason why we're keeping Matt Canada, in your opinion? That's, is that why? Th- is that the answer? Is that the company line? <sighs> Here's where I would go, Joey. Yes, because think about young quarterbacks in this league that have struggled. I mean, I could name whether it's Baker Mayfield or Mitch Trubisky. I I could go on and on. It shouldn't Mm -hmm. be, okay, this young quarterback just stinks. A lot of times it's the coaching. And when it's the coaching when, okay, rip the Band-Aid off to treat the flesh wound, and then you're doing that again the next offseason, again the next offseason, again the next offseason. I'm not saying Mitch Trubisky or Baker Mayfield were destined to be Hall of Fame quarterbacks, but that's the reality of the situation of when they got into the league, you're stunting the development of a young rookie quarterback, at least if you have that continuity. The idea is to build on that in 2023. So again, that has to be the base for the Steelers from the outset, from the get-go week one of the 2023 season. Yeah, my only push, my only thing with Matt Canada is, you know, and, and I know a lot of Steelers fans that wish that they had kicked his ass out the door. Uh, mm-hmm. But no, but now he's coming back. And there actually might be something to that continuity uh, narrative that might be positive for Kenny Pickett moving forward. The only thing about it is, uh, you know, and I think it's a fair criticism sometimes of um, the Steelers, you know, they don't want to rock the boat too much. And I think Matt Canada philosophically fits how Mike Tomlin wants to play his football games these days. And, and the only thing that I'll say about that is that, you know, I was just curious if a guy like Byron Leftwich or someone else would be willing to push the envelope with Kenny Pickett in year two and, you know, read between the lines of what I'm saying. Air yards, right? I mean, a, a couple more shots uh, down the field, maybe work the middle of the field a little bit more. I mean, how many more George Pickens amazing catches by the sideline where you have to review it 75 times? Uh, before you can decide whether it's an amazing catch or not. I mean, let's get him in a different, let's get him on different spots in the field a little bit and try and open it up in year two. I'm hoping that that happens with Matt Canada, but um, it does fit a little bit with the company line of, hey, we're going to play, we're going to win 16 to 13, and we're going to see how it goes. That's not necessarily Kenny Pickett's fault yet. And I'm wondering if Matt Canada can continue to push that envelope next year. Let me piggyback off this really quickly, and we will move on, Joey. But let me piggyback off this really quickly, too. Is if the Steelers were to have fired Matt Canada and bring in a hot coordinator like a Byron Leftwich, what's to say if the Steelers had success that Leftwich doesn't leave to take a head coaching job elsewhere after just one season? Because 
Mike Tomlin is a defensive coach. So that's another thing to keep in mind is would another team then poach your young, hot offensive coordinator that's able to fix things and get things right with your offense because it is an offensive league to where he's then wanted as a head honcho a year later and you're restarting this process all over again. So that's at least the the logic and the thought process, I think, there. No, and, and final point, it's a great point because anyone who hires Byron Leftwich as an offensive coordinator has to live in that reality that the expiration date with him and the organization could be limited because if he has success, he moves on. But, but again, good problem to have. Good problem yes. to have. Yeah. Uh, you know, hire a great quarterbacks coach and then, uh, you know, hire from within and uh, and then you move on. Um, but right. No, no, it's, Joey, it's a good point. Let's go to the flip side, Joey. Least appealing head coaching vacancy among the four right now. I, I I'll start here. I would either say the Colts or the Cardinals, and I'd probably argue the the Cardinals right now, just given the uncertainty with the Kyler Murray contract coming back from a season-ending injury as well. Who knows when he'll be back? Um, you know, J.J. Watt's retiring, and it's not to say he was what he was with the Texans, but that locker room presence he brings. DeAndre Hopkins is probably gone, so I, I don't know what kind of canvas you're working with because you're locked into that Kyler Murray deal, and I don't know when he's coming back, so at least in the immediate future, I'd probably say the Cardinals among the four remaining right now. Yeah, I know I name dropped the Texans as a job that I would want to take, but you know, I, I hear so many awful things about the people <laughs> that run the Texans um, from so many different yeah. sources that they're so yeah. poorly run. And, and you know, it honestly, it spills out onto the field. Uh, you know, they've been an awful franchise in the win and loss column mm -hmm. on the field. And they've also been an awful franchise off the field for several years. Um, highly not appealing, but I'm going to, I'm going to also agree with you with the Cardinals because what's so interesting about it is Kyler Murray will not start week one of next year. And mm -hmm. there's a great chance that Kyler Murray might not be on the field until week 10, week 11, week 12. And you know, it's not an, it is an apples to oranges, right? But let's just take an easy example. And let's, let's look at what the Browns did last year and the Browns brought in Jacoby Brissett. And I'm not saying that they were a successful team, but it looks like they had kind of gotten locked in on Jacoby Brissett, you know, in his mediocrity or, or his success or his non-success. And you had to then, then switch back over to the guy that everyone knew was going to be the quarterback in the end, Deshaun Watson. And honestly, it went pretty terrible. And if we look at the past history with Kyler Murray, um, he doesn't seem to be apparently, you know, um, someone who's mentally tough. I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to say that right now. So whoever comes in to coach that Cardinals team, you have to figure out the quarterback position for the first 10 weeks of the season. You have to try and win games with him, convince the locker room and the media that you are behind this guy 110%. But, oh, by the way, uh, no, Kyler's still our guy. Uh, Kyler's still our guy, but we believe in X. And you have to play this dance for the next 10, 11 weeks of the season in your very first year. And then you have to make sure that Kyler Murray and you are tied at the hip. And he's your best buddy after all of that. It's just clunky, right? It's a tough transition, and you almost kind of think – I mean, I knew that they were heading towards the end of Kingsbury, but you would almost think that they would keep him as a lame duck just to get through the Kyler injury and then wipe the slate clean and move on. They can't do that. They have to bring in someone new. It's just a bad situation. It's awkward from the get-go. You have to appease both masters at the same time. Keep Kyler Murray happy while also mm -hmm. convince your football team that the quarterback that you have is going to win you football games. I just – that's not appealing to me at all. Speaking to another great offensive mind that's out there who might be better suited as an offensive coordinator, Cliff Kingsbury, I know you're in Thailand listening to Joey and I right now. A couple things. Number one, we'd have loved to have you in Pittsburgh as the offensive coordinator of the Steelers. Number two, if you need someone to house sit your estate, your beautiful, lush, uh, use whatever Adjective you want to use, you know, it's, I, I want to smell like Cliff Kingsbury. I want to have his cologne. If you need someone to house it for you, Cliff, I'm your guy. I'm happy to do it. And I'm happy to look over your state while you're off in Thailand exploring and enjoying some much deserved time off. We're very clean or cleanly, right? We're very cleanly. Um, yeah. we're, we're, we, no noise. We don't do loud noise after 9 PM. We're not that we're not those kinds of people. And uh, we will most certainly uh, sit on every single plush couch that you have. And oh. we can work a remote very easily. You don't need to leave directions out for us of how to work your DirecTV and all of your different streaming options. We can figure it out quickly. We're, we're low maintenance. This to me Bring is like the us. number one storyline of the offseason, Joey, is what happens to his estate now that he's no longer the head coach of the Cardinals. Like, where is Aaron Rodgers wind up, Tom Brady, Lamar Jackson? I don't really care. 
What's happening to Cliff Kingsbury estate? I'd like to get to the bottom of this. I mean, someone in his close circle, right? One of his buddies has got to be house sitting and having the time of his life. Oh Hopefully my gosh. Not like a weekend, oh. not like a weekend at Bernie's time of your life where, you know, you, you're kind <laughs> of having a memorable moment that could also put you in jail, but you yeah. know, you're really just kind of like, you're just savoring it and you're counting down the days and you're like, Cliff, Thailand is beautiful, buddy. You stay there as long as you need. We're fine yeah. here. We're, Let's we're just host the, uh, the next NFL draft. Let's just host it at Cliff Kingsbury's place at his pad. In all honesty, <laughs> And it was one of the luxuries Come at you live. having the remote draft during the pandemic and everything too, is we, we got to see Cliff Kingsbury in his element. Oh man. We'll have Ike uh, out there. We'll, we'll be grilling some meat. We'll bring some stuff in. Uh, Love it. You know, we'll have, we'll have Corey with a little chipping green in the back. It'll be, it'll be great. Stay, enjoy your time, Cliff. Enjoy yes, your time. Absolutely. Give us the keys and everything will be fine. We will move on. Um, I'm going to be Ryan Poles. Uh, excuse me. You're going to be Ryan Poles. I'll be Omar Khan. In retrospect, ahead of the NFL trade deadline this past year, you know, I call you and to say, hey, we want a second round pick for Chase Claypool. At the time, I know you're trying to pay to keep the lights off, keep Claypool away from the Packers. But like, how quickly are you hanging up the phone in retrospect with this deal, Joey? Are you sure you don't want our newly acquired Ravens pick? It's pick mm. 54. Good number. Mm. It's a good, it's a good number. Um, mm. look, as it stands right now, um, Steelers Nation, um, this is a gigantic win um for the Steelers. Uh, lo and behold, the Steelers move on from a wide receiver and they win out again. Surprise, surprise. A headline that I've never read before. Um, for the <laughs> Chicago, for the Chicago Bears, I do have to say though. For the Chicago Bears at this time, it is an INC. It's an incomplete just for right now. I now, agree. Of course, I agree. Because look, you know, when he came on for the Chicago Bears, uh, and, and look, this could be uh this could be uh, an indictment on Chase Claypool. This could also be, hey, let's let's wait and see how it goes. Because the only thing that they were letting him do was run go routes, comebacks, and bubble screens. That was yep. it. And honestly, yep. those three things that they were letting him do, they only let him run it maybe mm, 10 to 12 times a game. They were not playing him every single snap. And I think a big part of it also was the way that we ran our offense. We were trusting our wide receivers to do a lot of blocking in the outside run outside run zone scheme. Um, so if he wasn't able to pick up those blocks or understand a little bit of what we were trying to do out there with our bad offensive line, maybe we weren't able to just kind of throw him out there for a ton of snaps and just see what happens. So let's give the guy the offseason. Um, as you guys know that he is coming up for a contract after the end of next year, he is going to be incentivized. Um, does he have a long-term future with the Chicago bears? I don't know at this time, but I think the reason why we made this trade was to try and give Justin some more people around him, not to help him succeed tomorrow, but to try and give us some more evidence to say, this is our guy, Justin Fields. We know what the legs, we know what the head, we know what the heart, we don't know what the arm yet. And a lot of people are criticizing him for his arm. Can he pass the ball? We need to give him more opportunities to provide more evidence to close the case on that. So, you know, the fact that it turned into the 32nd pick um, is incredible for the Steelers. What a, what a, what a, what a move. And let's be honest, you guys are going to draft someone amazing at the wide receiver position again, as you do every <laughs> single year. Um, I, it makes me, it makes me so wildly upset. Um, uh, for those people that don't know, George Pickens, you know, outside of the, the main names, right? I just knew that the Bears were picking at 39 last year. George uh -huh. Pickens was my favorite wide receiver out of the bunch over Watson, over a bunch of people, obviously not over Olave and Wilson. Let's be real. Sure, um, sure. And, you know, lo and behold, where does he end up? He goes to wide receiver university uh, with the Pittsburgh Steelers. So um, good for Pittsburgh right now. But I I'm curious to hear on you. I mean, it's, it's a wait and see with the Chicago Bears, right? I'm not giving up on him. Yeah. I, I'm with you there, and that's short sighted, especially mid season to pick up new concepts and everything. And you don't have the rapport that you would with the quarterback, as you'll have during training camp, preseason, just to, to develop that continuity it does take time. And we saw it with Kenny Pickett in his receivers because he gets inserted week four, and it's not smooth sailing from when he took over right away. And that's because, okay, in the offseason and in training camp and in the preseason, He's not getting those first team reps with the first team that takes time to build. So right now it's looking great, especially considering how everything shaped out. But Claypool, he has all the tools, the size, the speed, everything you'd want in a receiver for him 
It's between the ears. If he can put it together, I think he has all the ability in the world, but it's the consistency for him that's going to be the big thing. And we'll see because in a contract season, <laughs> money talks. So if he wants to prove his worth and going into last season, he made headlines saying he's a top three receiver in the league. I don't think he's anywhere near that, but he does have that big playability. We, he, we saw it as a rookie. As a rookie, he scores 11 touchdowns which was a Steelers franchise rookie record. Think of all the great players the Steelers have had, all the great receivers they've had. He tied a franchise rookie record with 11 touchdowns a few years back. You got to get him in the paint again and find creative ways to get him the ball and we'll see if the Bears can do that this upcoming season. Thrilled to have the 32nd pick, though, Joey. That was uh, it's icing on the cake. It's almost like having another first-round pick if you're the Steelers. Well, it kind of is, Mark. It is it's right great. because the it's Dolphins great. aren't getting their pick. Look, I mean, I'm with you, and, and don't and don't forget too as well. You know, end arounds, those little shovel passes in between the tackles in the red zone. Those are other areas where Chase Claypool can definitely help a team like the Chicago Bears. And you know, you need more big guys in a red zone, which I think the Bears eventually did improve in the red zone with Justin Fields by the end of the season. But again, um, something that they need to continue to work on uh, moving forward. You know, my, my my final thought on this, and I just want to get your perspective on it is um, you talked about in between the ears and, you know, just what, what do you, if you could just kind of hypothesize a little bit, what happened with Claypool and the Steelers? Is this an, was it an immaturity issue? I mean, we all know a little bit of, he decided to, you know, when he went into the media and asked them to play music during practice and then Tomlin mm -hmm. had to go out and publicly kind of, just say, you know, I, I'm the one. What did he say? I'm the one that delineates the structure or like it's such an amazing line. Um, but, you know, it's just something that you don't do. Right. You don't do. And it almost felt like from that moment on, Chase Claypool's number days were numbered in a Steelers uniform. Um, I can't say that those are completely correlated, but we all know that he is no longer on the team. So attitude wise, do you think overblown, properly blown with Chase Claypool right now? And what kind of growing up does he still need to do? I'll say properly because I did see some maturity, but the turning point, Joey, was that Minnesota game a year ago where Steelers mm. are trying to rally a furious comeback win, and he decides to do the, the celebration, marking the first down that's like, wait a second, the clock is not your friend here, and hurry up, snap, and get the, get the ball to the line of scrimmage so you can snap the ball to either spike it and conserve as much clock as possible. So it's one thing to do that. Other thing, honest about knowledge, but yep, I goofed that play. I've got to be better about the situational awareness of what it takes to win a football game in this league. But he doubles down, and I forget his exact answer, but was saying how, oh, that this, this isn't a problem. And when it affects your wins and losses, and wins and losses in this league affects people's ability to be employed in the NFL. When that, to me, was the turning point. I'm not saying that is the reason the Steelers traded him, but that was a turning point to me to where it was to say, hey, Let's see what else we got in the Steelers draft two receivers, not just George Pickens, who we all know and love, but Calvin Austin, the third, who didn't Austin. play a snap this mm -hmm. season on, uh, on IR all year long. He didn't play at all as a rookie. So Steelers don't have a problem drafting and developing young receivers. And uh, they decided to go with Deontay Johnson to give the big contract extension to on the eve of this past season. So with Claypool's days numbered, it's like you can't keep everybody, and you go from there. Well, and it says a lot too, right? They decided to extend Deontay, and they didn't even, yep. you know, they did not get to that place with Chase Claypool. And yeah, and to your point too, as well, when you're on a Steelers team where the last two seasons, um, your playoff, whether you're in the playoffs or not, comes down to the final game, um, and every, everything's close like that. Yeah, you need to be on your p's and q's and execute. Um, yeah, and unfortunately, Chase Claypool had some had some moments that just did not look great uh, in the moment. You know what I mean? And um, and now hopefully Joey, he gets a thousand yards and ten touchdowns for the Bears. <laughs> hey, he's in the Moving NFC. On. So I don't mind. Yes, <laughs> yeah, seriously, Joey. I want to turn the floor over to you. I, I'll tell you what I think that the Bears should do, but we're going to give you the keys to the Cadillac. What's the smart way to have this conversation? What do the Bears do with the number one pick? Ah, ah, yes. The topic that she'll be uh, rattling in my brain for the next several months um, at the very least. Look, uh, so let me just kind of bring everyone up to speed of where Bears Twitter is right now. Bears oh, Twitter. Man. And here's here we what, go. And here's, here we go. Well, here, but here's what's so funny. No, this is what it is. This is where it is, Mark, is that now 
uh, a lot of mock drafts are starting to come out, right? And a lot of mock drafts are starting to come out, which means that the first mock draft, a lot of these guys have decided that we're not going to do trades. We're just going to try and rank players appropriately. So uh, like a bunch of marionettes, um, we've kind of, the Bears Twitter has moved off of any sort of sense of trade right now. We're just talking about what it would be like if we actually took the number one pick and kept it and did not trade it. Um, of course, when the when the narrative moves over back over to trades, Bears Twitter will go nuts again. And we've seen some really crazy stuff. Um, you know, if you're into uh, conspiracy theories, lizard people and crazy bears trades, uh, they're all in one place. Uh, they're all in one place right now. But here's the thing is that we have to keep in mind that at the very least, Mark, here's the smart conversation is that you have the number one pick. And I'm not saying this to be obvious. I'm saying this to remind ourselves that this is a good thing. There is there the possibilities of this going poorly, or we're already trying to gauge past fail of what the Bears do or don't do with this pick, and whether whatever we trade for is it enough? Will it be enough ever? Guess what? If you trade for something, you're getting more. That's a good thing. And if you stay at the number one pick and you draft, that means that you're drafting the presumptive number one prospect out of the entire pool of NFL players that are going to be eligible for the NFL draft this year. It's a very, very prestigious and very uh, exclusive uh, place that the Chicago Bears are in right now, and we should not take that for granted. I'm kind of curious to hear what you think about it a little bit because what I'm starting to hear, and I've just started kind of do a little bit of my research. I do not watch college football. I basically go from, here's my process. I watch YouTube clips to watching the actual long stretch of the games, and then I actually start reading draft profiles. I don't really pay a lot of attention to the combine unless it's something that's so glaring on the plus or on the minus side. Like he runs a mm-hmm. four nine forty, or he runs a four two forty. One of the two. That's probably it. anything in the middle is whatever to me. But I, sure. I'm kind of starting to realize that is this draft deep? Um, is this draft top heavy? And if it is top heavy, how top heavy is it? And what's the drop off here? And what are the Bears looking at? Because I think that's going to be really, really, really important. You can say to yourself all day long, we're going to trade with Team X for three first-round picks and all this other kinds of stuff. But you do have to try and get some sort of value this year. And if this is a draft where it's going to be hit or miss, you really have to make sure that you're in a position to get a guy that's going to hit this year. Um, I'm on the camp that I do hope that they do trade the pick, if at all possible. We need as much help as we possibly can. And keep in mind that future first round picks next year usually is probably going to come from a team that isn't very good this coming year because they're probably taking a quarterback on his rookie deal. So, you know, the possibilities are endless. What is also most important is that this is just crucial for Ryan Poles, Mark. I mean, this can really kind of make or break his tenure with the Chicago Bears before it even really gets started. Um, But I'm glad we're going to find out now than opposed to two or three years down the road like we did with the Ryan Pace. All right. So here's what I'm doing if I'm the Chicago Bears. I'm with you. I'm trading the pick. And to me, you finally have a guy in Justin Field. that The clock's ticking. You got three years left on his rookie deal. But you've got an absolute stud out of Georgia who can fortify the middle of your defense for the next decade plus. It's can't miss. It pops off the tape. And this dude is violent at the line of scrimmage in Jalen Carter. You trade down to the point to where you know you can still get him. You get back picks of what you can. And you move forward with more picks in more areas and because the Bears have several positions of need. But you start at the line of scrimmage, and it's like field can at least be good enough. I know the Bears in the quarterback situation, they've been trying to figure this out since Luckman. Play the elements. Play like I understand it's a quarterback league, but do what <laughs> made you successful as a franchise when you have had success. It's a stout defense, it's running the ball and quote unquote bear weather. Lord only knows how long, much longer they'll be in Soldier Field. But that's what I'm doing is I'm trading down. I'm getting Jalen Carter, and I'm laughing when we at least have a dude at the line of scrimmage that can be a boss for you for, for the foreseeable future. That's what I'm doing if I'm the Bears. I think that's the ideal scenario. But the problem with that is that you can't trade probably past for the Indianapolis Colts, which means that you're trying to make a deal with two suitors right now, the Houston Texans of the Indianapolis Colts, which is totally fine. What that does, though, is it will create this unrealistic expectation of us grading what is and what isn't enough in the trade return um, with the Indianapolis Colts. Um, and I, unfortunately, I don't think Ryan Poles can probably win in this one. You know what I'm saying? Unless he probably does some sort of, 
you know, crazy Godfather deal, which I'm not exactly sure what that even looks like right now. And I'm sure Twitter can probably answer it for me right now. But there is a situation where Ryan Poles probably will be criticized um, one way or another. If he stays at the number one pick, he will be criticized for not trading out. And if he trades the pick somehow to number four, uh, people are going to look at that compensation and they're going to pick it apart to see if we got enough. In my personal opinion, if we trade back to four and we get Jalen Carter and we get something else, X, Y, Z, let's not play with numbers right now. Let's not play with value. Something else. That feels like the biggest win to me right now because you have something for the future. You have something for right now with Jalen Carter and you can walk into next year and feel pretty good about yourself. The thing that I keep trying to remind Bears fans is too, is that just because you, you get that, what, what's so important about getting that draft capital, Mark, and you'll agree with this, is that it isn't so much about who you're going to draft. It's that those pieces can also be draft, can be traded for cost certainty with talented players in the NFL. And we've seen yeah. it across yep. the league right now that, look, look at this wide receiver cl class coming up in free agency right now. No one's going to blow your hair back. It's Juju Smith-Schuster. Sorry, Steelers fans, but he's not a top-notch wide receiver. You know, Jacoby Myers, a couple of other players, DJ Chark, right? You're not finding that number one receiver in the offseason from free agency. You're going to mm -hmm. have to probably find it via trade. And what does that take? First-round picks, second-round picks, stuff the Bears that want to keep, don't have. We need to get more of those. So it just continues to build for a future that hopefully the Chicago Bears can um, can create. And it all begins with what they do with this number one pick. Yep. And here's why I'm building with the line, too. Some people, what about the weapons for Justin Fields? Uh, Jacob Infante tweeted this. Bears have created pressure on just 24% of pass rushing snaps this year, lowest in the league. On the flip side, Justin Fields pressured an NFL worst 44.3% of his dropbacks. Got to fix the trenches, sack the league high this year as well. I understand that there's things that he can do to help prevent that. But if your receivers aren't getting open and the boys up front aren't blocking for you, you got to fix and patch one hole at a time. And for me, it starts up front. And that's where I'm starting for the Bears. So you start that by getting the biggest stud up front because if you don't have a stout interior, Joey, nothing else matters. You could get Will Anderson, you could bring in Bryce Young, have five years of Bryce Young on a rookie deal. Bryce Young at 180 pounds soaking wet behind the Chicago Bears offensive line sounds like a recipe for disaster, if you ask me. It's no knock on Bryce Young. It's the reality of what the Bears' current roster configuration is right now. And this is a little inside football, so I don't want to get too far into the weeds on the Chicago Bears here on the Believe in Steelers podcast. But another big no, no, thing that we good. talk about, one of the big things that we talk about in Chicago too as well, and this is why you need to fix that offensive line and that defensive line is that there is a conversation right now about you know what type of receivers are going to help Justin Fields moving forward in the future what the Bears deploy right now are big physical receivers now Equinemius St. Brown was a productive player for us this year not because of what he did catching the ball but what he did in the blocking game to be able to help Justin Fields you know and our running game you know we had one of the best running games in the NFL part of that reason was we got big physical receivers like Equinemius St. Brown Nikhil Harry, you know, and obviously we traded for Chase Claypool guys out there that can help kind of shore that up a little bit. There are a lot of people though, that think does Justin Fields really need big physical receivers that might not necessarily get open. Maybe you have to throw them into a little bit tighter windows or does Justin Fields need someone that is quick, that is twitchy, that can play in the slot and also play to the outside too as well. And all you need to do is get the ball into his hands or all you maybe need to do is chuck the ball 40 yards down the field. And the guy's going to burn a guy down the field and be able to make that pass what is going to help Justin Fields more what type of receiver is going to help him so the question is why don't you just fix the offensive line first and then you can start figuring out the type of wide receivers you want instead of trying to create the wide receivers to protect your offensive line that seems a little backwards to me that's how the Chicago Bears have been doing it and honestly by taking a guy like Jalen Carter it's going to do wonders for us if we can get some extra picks I personally I would love that first round pick next year I would really love to get that second round pick from the Colts or the Texans and get back into that area that we already mm. gave up for Chase Claypool. And then we can start playing around in the world of offensive linemen on that side of the ball and, and sort of take it from there. Um, it, it, but here's the thing though. It's, it's fascinating. It's interesting. Everyone's talking about the Chicago bears and, and it's going to create a lot of polarizing conversations and, and, and automatically our second-year GM, who's never done it before, is already in the off-season of his life right now. Yeah, And I would say this yep. is probably a more crucial off-season than the Mitch Trubisky one. 
Yes, yes. And here's the thing, too, with the Bears, number one overall pick. They haven't had the number one pick since the 40s, which is like the Bears aren't even good at being bad, Joey. Hey, you know talk what to I mean? the Chicago like, Bulls about that too while we're at it. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, All right. So the yeah, Bears no, have Chicago like 92. Can't suck. I love your hat too right now. I'm wearing a throwback 90s Bulls hat, 92 season. Joey, which free agent do you want to see the Bears sign? They've got about $92 million, almost $100 million in salary cap space. Is there a name out there that's like, go get that guy, go sign him yesterday? You know, there's a lot of interesting paths that I think the Chicago Bears can take. Um, I think they need to probably go again. They probably need to go quantity over quality one more season. They have, yeah, as you mentioned, they have a ton of cap space. I hope they don't spend it all in one off season. Um, my, you know, my beautiful co-host uh, with Believe in Bears, Corey Wooten, wants a guy like Marcus Davenport, a guy like a Deron Payne. They need quality professionals. I mean, I know we want to get younger on the defensive line but and on the offensive line, but eventually you need to get some people that know what they're doing out there a little bit while you are trying to infuse some youth into both sides of the football on the trench side of things. So, you know, Marcus Davenport, Darren Payne is interesting. A guy that's kind of another interesting name out there um, that I don't think is going to cost them as much as Roquan Smith, but you can kind of get that production back a little bit. Pairing a Jack Sanborn with a Levante David is interesting. Um, I think mm. Levante David's probably going to want to go to a winner. But if you want to say to yourself, okay, well, we're still a little bit of a work in progress. Can we get some professionals in the room, get some leaders here, and really fortify what is already turning into a very strong secondary with another linebacker like Levante David if the Buccaneers do blow it up? Um, I'm very curious about that. In terms of free agency wide receivers, I don't really want any of them. Um, if you look yeah. at the tight end position, um, I think the tight end position is going to be interesting. There are going to be some names out there like a Mike Gesicki. I think Hayden Hurst hits the street one more time. Um, mm -hmm. If the Bears could get a second tight end, I do think that that is really going to help out a, a running first quarterback like Justin Fields. You know, we've been kind of comparing his game a lot to Cam Newton. And part of that isn't so much of the makeup of the player, but just obviously, you know, the style of they, the, you know, the physical traits and the style that they play with. And if you look at Cam Newton, once they brought in Greg Olson, and had someone there in that tight end position, that in line, the guy can also maybe go out and catch some passes. I like Cole Komet a lot, but we need a little bit more of that. I'd be very interested in that. And then keep your eye out on the trade market. The trade market with the Chicago Bears is going to be very interesting for that wide receiver. They've been tied to DeAndre Hopkins. Corey Wooten wants, uh, you know, he wants Mike Evans. He wants them to take maybe a run at Mike Evans. Mm -hmm. I think Devontae Adams is probably pie in the sky. I don't see that probably happening. Um, but we'll see what they can possibly do from that area. They need one to two more guys in that area. And then the big X factor, Mark, and I want to get your opinion on this. If you are the Chicago Bears and you don't like this wide receiver draft class, you don't really like the free agency class, and you got to keep your powder dry from the draft capital standpoint, and you got a ton of money, would you spend on a running back? Would you spend on on a Josh Jacobs, would you spend on a Saquon Barkley if you're the Chicago Bears? Someone's going to give it no. to him. Someone's going to give him that money. No. Yeah, because Herbert, I think, can at least help carry some of the load. I don't know if Herbert's a number one, and I know you know Barkley would be an upgrade from Montgomery at least in theory. But again, it comes with a price, so. I would say no, because I think you can get that level of production from someone you're paying a fraction of that salary. It's it's more about the positional value of running back more so than it is Saquon Barkley itself, Joey. Yeah, I just I, think I'm not from the I'm not there with Saquon. I I wouldn't. It's a depreciating yeah, well, asset. I, oh, absolutely, and I mean you're going to be you know the guaranteed money alone. You know, I mean, we're looking at deals. I'm not saying Saquon's Zeke Elliott, but you know what I mean? We we see these deals happen all the time and they rarely do mm -hmm. work out unless your name's Derrick Henry um, or maybe if your name's Christian McCaffrey to this point. Um, but if you're the Chicago Bears in free agency, I think it's an unsexy offseason, man. I would spend a ton of money on the defensive line, offensive line, maybe not top shelf, big dollar name guys. Like I don't think Orlando Brown or Mike McGlinchey or any of those guys on the offensive line is going to really do it for the Chicago Bears. But if they can just get quality professionals and just get better at those two sides of the ball, um, I think you will see progress. I'm not saying the Bears are going to win the Super Bowl next year, um, but I do I do not expect them to be a top five NFL draft pick the following year. I do Absolutely. expect progress at that point, right? I mean, you'd have to think that. I mean, Mark, do you know what Justin Fields' career record is right now? <sighs> 
You it, ready? Are you yeah. ready for this? Lay it on me. Lay it on me. It's five and twenty-one. Brutal. He's five and twenty-one as a starting Brutal. quarterback. And I know, look, wins and losses, it doesn't speak, uh, you know, it doesn't tell everything about the player, but eventually it is going to say a little bit of something, right? Of like, is Justin Fields our guy? Oh, I don't know. He has a record of four, a record of nine and thirty-four heading into his fourth year as an NFL quarterback. There's an optic there that doesn't look very good. And at some point, you do have to put the guy in a position to say to yourself, can you go out and win us a football game now? Can you go out and do that? We fell short this year, and we all know why that happened. Next year, it should look a little bit different. And I don't If think you that, can't get into the playoffs with a much. quarterback on his rookie deal, Joey, you're delaying the inevitable, in all honesty. And this is what's going to happen with the narrative because it happens with young quarterbacks in this league. He's still the shiny toy, and it's incredible what he does, the marketability, the runs, the electricity, the excitement. But if you can't win with a quarterback on his rookie deal, it's not going to get any better when you give him that massive contract extension. So that narrative about Justin Fields is going to change real quick. So if you're not not just making the playoffs, Joey, I'm talking about contending because these are conversations we're already starting to have in Pittsburgh with Kenny Pickett as he enters year two because – when you got a rookie quarterback on his rookie deal, if he's worth his salt, he will quickly outperform what he's making on his rookie contract. We're seeing it with the Bengals right now with Joe Burrow. Mm-hmm. So if that doesn't change and change quickly with Justin Fields, this conversation, it, it, listen, if the Bears are still in the same spot a year from now where they're at right now, this conversation is going to be a very, very different conversation about Justin Fields than the one we're having right now. Yeah, philosophically, Mark, you know, where are you on that, right? Rookie year, you kind of write off, right? It's a, you write it off or it's a wash and you just kind of look, you obsess, you observe, you upset, you assess, you observe, and you try and look for positives. And you obviously you look at the negatives by year two, right? You should know not whether he's going to be a franchise guy, but whether you want to stick with him and think mm-hmm. that you can win with him. And I think we've decided, I think Justin Fields showed that, I think a little bit this year, that there is a world where you can win with Justin Fields. But Mark, are you, by year three though, right? I mean, if by year three, yeah. you kind of are, you kind of are who you are as a quarterback. A- a- am I, am I wrong with that assumption? Yeah. yeah yes. Daniel but at Jones, the same time too, at the same time too, it's like, what have the bears put around Justin Fields that would enable him to succeed? And I would listen this is just the reality, however you feel about it. And I'm not going to single out anything. Justin Fields has the top five worst skill position players and a top five worst offensive line in the league. Top in two. the league. <laughs> yeah. yes. I'm being polite here. I'm being polite. So what have you done to put him in a, a position to succeed? So then you make excuses and then it's, oh, we give him the, the, the big deal. And you're still in the same problem. And it's just like rinse and repeat yet again. Uh, with the Chicago Bears, Joey. We need to go rapid fire because we need to wrap here soon. So we're going to go rapid fire here. Um, Mitch Trubisky under contract one more year with the Steelers. What does his future hold beyond the 2023 season in your in your eyes, Joey? So wait, excuse me. He is coming back with the Pittsburgh Steelers? He's got we- one more year on his deal with the Steelers. Um, wow. What does his future hold? Well, unfortunately, you know, I, this season went really poorly for Mitch, right? I mean, we yeah. all tried to talk ourselves into it. I even tried to talk myself into, you know, him probably playing well in September and maybe buying himself a little time, giving himself a little tape, a little tape for his future. Uh, that tape is bad, Mark. That tape is very bad right now. So, okay. After this next year, I mean, look, the guy's going to be a career backup. He's going to be a chase Daniel. There's nothing wrong with that. The dude can make a ton of money in the NFL still doing that. Um, But again, I mean, I think it's going to be very difficult for him uh, moving forward. And I think he's going to have a wonderful career playing behind probably some elite quarterback play uh, for many years to come and never see the field. All right. I'm with you there. Honestly, well said. And we will continue on. Which team signs Mason Rudolph this offseason? There's no way he's back in Pittsburgh as the third stringer. If you say to Bishop Sycamore, I have to get that out there. You would have beaten me to the punch. But in all seriousness, where do you think Mason Rudolph winds up? I mean, my goodness. I mean, he's going to have to go in and compete for a job, right? I mean, I don't think anyone's going to give him the keys to a backup castle. Um, Let's look at some of these teams. Let's look at some of these teams, right? The Indianapolis Colts, they love tall guys. Am I right? (laughs) They love guys that are they love guys that are tall. Um, oh man! Look, I, 
it ha- it has to be a situation where you have a quarterback that you're probably confident that he's going to play at least 70% or 80% of the season. Um, and, and if he, he doesn't play, your season is probably screwed one way or the other. So, um, yeah, no, I would look at probably teams, uh, teams along those. I think Cardinals, yeah, Cardinals isn't a bad move. Um, I'm kind of curious to see, you know, what, you know, like what, what, what do the Dolphins do exactly? You know, not just with Tua, but with Teddy Bridgewater moving forward. Mm-hmm. You know, does Teddy move on to somewhere else? You know, maybe Mason lands in a place like that. Um, you know, the Houston Texans are going to be bringing in everybody and anybody. So I think what might possibly happen is Mason starts with the team, gets a little, gets some reps, gets some run in the preseason. Maybe he makes an opening day roster, maybe not. Maybe he lands somewhere else. And I could see him kind of as a vagabond for a year for a team that is, you know, that's QB needy. I mean, let's look at the Jets for a second. You know what I mean? Is he Joe Flacco's replacement as a possible backup there? You know, something along those lines. Who's the backup in Detroit right now? They like it. They got another tall guy there. He's got to go somewhere where they need tall guys, Mark. I think that's probably the best fit for him. I hate even manifesting this, but I do not look forward to the day of the Mason Rudolph revenge game against the Steelers. It will happen at some point during his career, and I do not look forward to that day, Joey. Oh, my God. He'll be on the Ravens. It'll be 9-6. to six. No, no. Fourth quarter, six minutes to go in the game. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, let's end here, and yeah. this will be the final topic of the show. We're in the AFC Championship, NFC Championship games, Super Bowl favorites. L- lay it on me. Who do you got playing in the big game and who you got winning it all? Man, so I walked, so I'm allowed to change my mind. I walked into the postseason and I had the uh I had a Chiefs 49ers before any playoff game was played as my Super mm-hmm. Bowl picks at this time. Um heading into this weekend, though, I am flipping that. I am going Bengals, Eagles. Um, here is oh. why. First of all, with the Bengals last year. Um, you know, gritty effort, right? But if you watch that Bengals team, um, they got pretty damn lucky uh, in multiple different areas, in multiple different spots, through multiple different playoff games to land themselves in that spot. Not so, saying that they're undeserving, but they had a little bit of that juju, a little bit of that mojo that I think you kind of need as a team to kind of get you there. I think the 49ers have that mojo, that little that, that little extra juju right now with Brock Purdy. From the Bengals side, I just think Joe Burrow is playing so well right now. And, and look, I think Patrick Mahomes, high ankle sprain, um, I think it it's significant, right? Even if he is just 15, 20% off of his game a little bit. You saw what happened, you know, in the game last week. You know, he got off to a great start. He was – the first couple drives Patrick Mahomes had was a highlight reel that anybody, Mason Rudolph, would pay all of his life savings for just on those two drives for a highlight reel. I mean, every single angle, Patrick Mahomes was fantastic. Um, after that injury, obviously, it was a little bit of tough sledding. And you just got to ask yourself, outside of Travis Kelsey, where is it coming from from the Chiefs' perspective? And I get it. Mm. Andy Reid can drop a great play like anybody else, but this is a consistency factor. This is a four-quarters factor for me right now. And Isaiah Pacheco and Kadarius Tony, and even Juju, who is that guy that's going to be able to step up, not once, not twice, but four or five times in that game to kind of balance out just the way that I think that this Bengals offense is playing right now in the conference confidence that Joe Burrow has and you know you look at that Joe Burrow versus Patrick Mahomes it's crazy that Burrow is three and oh lifetime versus Patrick Mahomes right now mm-hmm. but I gotta tell you I think it goes to four and oh on the other side of the ball the 49ers are playing great you started to see it though from Brock Purdy just a little bit right it's mm-hmm. not midnight for Brock Purdy but it's 1145 and maybe it's time to call an Uber because your ride might turn into a pumpkin it's getting dangerously close and I know that the Eagles have a hard time stopping the run, but I still think the Eagles have enough blue chip players on defense. Their offense is doing just fine. And look, they're going to need 49ers are going to need to score more than 19 points in this game to beat a Philadelphia Eagles team. So I give the edge to the Eagles right now. So I got Bengals, I got Eagles, and if you put those two teams together, give me Joe Cool. I'm sorry, man. The Super Bowl might be coming out of the AFC North this year. The wow. Bengals might be taking it home this year. Bengals win the Super Bowl. Wow. Wow. Joey Christopoulos, what a pick. What a pick. Oh, I'm I'm on record. Listen, if I don't pick the Chiefs, my family now lives in Kansas City. I'm out of the will, Joey, so I have to pick the Chiefs. I don't have a choice. Yeah. And then I'm going with the Eagles as well, and I've got the Chiefs winning in the Super Bowl. We go against Mahomes every year. 
the three and zero against the Bengals. I think that motivates them. And everyone made such a big stink about the Bengals being without three of their starting offensive linemen against the Bills. Didn't make a difference in that game, but could it against Kansas City, who will be playing at home, Arrowhead Stadium, one of the loudest stadiums in all of professional sports. So that's the reason I'm going with the Chiefs. And then the Eagles, they've just beaten teams in a multitude of ways. And it's as simple as, okay, very, very evenly uh, stacked teams when you go to the matchups. But to me, it's Jalen Hurts over Brock Purdy, at least on paper. So that's why I'm picking the Eagles there. And I think the Chiefs take care of business because we do this every year and it's like, oh, who's really the top quarterback in the league? If it, if Burrow beats Mahomes, it will be Burrow. At least that'll be the conversation. But Mahomes is in the elite tier one status and deserves to be. And even on a bum ankle, I think he finds a way. I just think the offensive genius of – Andy Reid, Eric Bieniemy are going to find a way because when Mahomes left that game, they pounded the rock with Pancheco and were able to get it done. And that's the re- – listen, Josh Allen has taken his lumps. The Bills couldn't run the ball this season. It's not a news flash, but when you need it, point blank period in the playoffs and you got to get it done, they couldn't do that. The Chiefs did that when Mahomes went down and they had Chad Henney in the game. So that's the reason – listen – it's going to be two excellent matchups. And right now the spreads are less than three points in each game. So I cannot wait. Um, Joey, I want to give you the opportunity to plug your shows. Uh, I know you do a multitude of great work here on the Believe Network. The floor is yours. Plug whatever you need to. And thank you for your time this afternoon. Uh, Well, Mark, thank you for bringing me here on Believe in Steelers. Um, Fantastic program for everyone watching. Continue to watch. Tell a friend about this show. Keep on coming back. It's going to be a great offseason, man. You do such great content. And, uh, you know, the friendship that we've developed over the last couple of years has been awesome, man. So I can't wait to do this again with you very soon. Uh, Thank you for giving me that time. Um, Twitter, uh, you can follow me at Joey Sports Guy. It's vague. It's easy to remember. Just go ahead and do it. Check it out. Uh, you can follow me. Um, obviously, we talk a lot about Chicago sports, but we try and branch out as well. Talk major NFL and major sports, too, as well. Um, I host two shows for the Believe Podcast Network. I host Bet on Chicago. Uh, we do a little bit of some gambling talk for sure, but that's just a really show that celebrates all things Chicago sports, entertainment, um, history, um, the, the voices and all the great personalities that make up all the great scene out there. So make sure you check that out. And then I host Believe in Bears with former Bears defensive end Corey Wooten. Uh, Corey Wooten, my man, Northwestern Wildcats, very fine. Is doing fantastic work right now all throughout the Chicago media scene. Uh, we do show two as well. And look, it's going to be a wild offseason for the Chicago Bears. We have the number one pick. We have a ton of cap space. Um, everything is going to be kind of revolving strangely around what the Chicago Bears do or don't do with this offseason moving forward. So make sure you come on and check it out because our information might help out your team too as well. You never know. And who knows, maybe we'll give away the 32nd pick in the draft to a particular team that uh, shall remain unnamed with a banner that's above my head right now. Uh, But yeah, that'll do it for me, Mark. And uh, yeah, who knows? Maybe we'll do some live hits coming up soon, man. Uh, But good to see you and uh, can't wait to have you on my show soon. Let's talk again, uh, either just before or after the draft, Joey. Pleasure to have you, as always. Thanks, man. That's Joey Christopoulos. I'm Mark Bergen. Thanks for watching the Believe in Steelers show. I'll see you next week after the conference championship games. Enjoy the action. Take care, and so long, everybody.